Hello, everybody. Uh, as you saw from the webinar invitation, it is time to start revealing Eurostudent 8 international results. Of course, we have had some sneak peeks before to findings from different countries and uh, some tentative uh, initial um, results have been also shared uh, within our inner circle at various uh, conferences or, or workshops before. But this is really the first time that international comparative results will be presented in public. Uh, we will start with uh, results from topical modules. And today our focus is on two rather intertwined um, topics, uh, impact of COVID-19 and the digitalization of uh, teaching, learning and student life. Uh, as we have two topics to cover today, we also have two speakers, Elisabeth Gendeli and Hendrik Schirmer. Elisabeth uh, works on education and youth policy research at an independent Estonian think tank called Praxis. She has been involved in the Eurostudents project since Eurostudent 7, uh, where she contributed to analysis on pathways into higher education and disabled students' retention and support. Besides the social dimension of higher education, Elizabeth likes to work on topics like migration and minorities in education and explore different ways for deepening the participation of marginalized groups in research. And our second speaker, Hendrik Schirmer, studied political science at the Leibniz University Hanover with an emphasis on political sociology. He has been working at the German Center for Higher Education Research and Science Studies since 2011. He started as a student assistant alongside his studies and supported many projects that utilized quantitative as well as qualitative uh, research methods and had both a national and international research focus. Since May 2017, Hendrik has been working as researcher, focusing on issues of regional diversity in social and economic conditions of student life and processes of regional and international mobility. He has been involved in the Eurostudent project uh, already since its fourth round. So long history already. Uh, before we start, uh, and I shouldn't forget that we have another very good news to tell you as well that the registration to Eurostudent 8 final conference is now open. And I just uh, posted the link to that as well. So if you're interested, then, then please take a look on the information and, uh, and feel free to register as well. Uh, but yes, I think I'm ready with my introduction. And as I know, Elizabeth will start. So please feel free to begin. Thank you, Madeleine. Uh, yeah, so we will be starting today with the effects of COVID-19 pandemic on students and higher education. And then we'll move on to Henrik, who will talk about digitalization. Um, and COVID-19, so the data that we have is from Eurostudent 8. So it's fresh data in the sense that it's from the latest Eurostudent round, but at the same time, uh, we won't be talking about the effects that students are feeling right now in May. 2024. So this little side note here when we're talking about the results, that's something that I want you to keep in mind as well. And uh, and even though it might feel right now that COVID-19 is something from the past and since the end of this very acute phase of the pandemic of uh, restrictions, uh, that higher education systems and our students have been dealing with so many other crises and challenges, but a little maybe spoiler alert from the results from Eurostudent 8 is that we see that there might be some long lasting effects of the pandemic that we should be aware of and, uh, and yeah, keep in mind. So what I'll be trying to answer today is that how does COVID-19 still impact our students and what kind of a future impact should our higher education systems be prepared for? And in Eurostudent 8, the data we collected is based on these two indicators. So the first one um, had students assess 
how much they are currently experiencing any impact of the pandemic on various different aspects of their studies, whether it's the duration of their studies, their motivation, quality of teaching, or, or financing their living expenses, for example. And the second indicator from your student aid survey uh, that uh, concerns the pandemic is the expectation of a continued impact of the pandemic on uh, further studies, on the student's labor market entry, and on their mental health situation. So these are the two indicators that my today's presentation and our topical module on the effects of COVID-19 uh, is based on. I'll first start with the current impact of the pandemic. And like I mentioned in the beginning, so the current here, we need to keep in mind uh, when your student data was collected, um, which was in most countries in summer 2022. But at the same time, you can maybe think of your own countries that how much the situation in summer 2022 differs from the situation today, considering that at least the countries that I know about in higher education didn't have many restrictions or on movement or on gathering anymore at that point. At the same time, I think we had the Omicron wave, so that might influence how students were feeling about some anxieties maybe. So you can try to think back to that situation as well to see how much of this can apply to exactly today's situation. Um, but first, uh, let's look at all these aspects that Euro student aid um, surveyed students about and here on this graph we can compare which aspects students felt uh, more negatively impacted by the pandemic and also more positively impacted by the pandemic and the ones that stand out the most as the most negatively impacted are contact with fellow students and the quality of teaching where more than half of the students noted that they are currently experiencing a negative or a very negative impact of the pandemic on these um, aspects And then let's uh, zoom into two of the most negatively impacted aspects. First one, then the contact with fellow students. And uh, here is the country comparison. I'll give you a moment to maybe find your country or the country that you are interested in. So yeah, what this graph shows us is that the most negative impact of the pandemic uh, on the contact with fellow students were felt in uh, Finland, Czech Republic, Netherlands, uh, Slovakia also, and less so in France, Portugal, and Azerbaijan, for example. So there are some quite, I think, yeah, noteworthy differences between countries as well. Uh, we also wanted to compare whether this negative impact of the pandemic still uh, felt on contact with fellow students whether there were any differences considering if the student was a student already before the pandemic or if they enrolled or only after the pandemic. So that's what we then compared. Uh, so here in this graph, you can only see the shares of students who reported a negative impact with the black symbols representing uh, the students who were enrolled already before the pandemic. So what becomes clear is that among those students who were enrolled already before, uh, we have a lot higher shares of students who feel the ne negative impact on the contact with um, other students, which for me at least was a bit surprising or maybe counterintuitive at first, because I expected that perhaps it's students who were only enrolled after the pandemic who haven't had this usual onboarding, maybe freshers week and, and, and contact with other students really developed that well because of the pandemic, so they would be feeling a more negative impact. But it seems that maybe what plays into this is rather this comparison of being able to compare uh, the situation before and after, which is what the students who were enrolled already before, which is what they have. So moving on to the second aspect, the most negatively impacted by the pandemic, which was the quality of teaching. Uh, here we can see again first the country comparisons and here the differences between countries are a little bit smaller. 
but still it's the Netherlands, Hungary and Estonia, also Finland, that uh, stand out as the countries where we have the highest shares of students who felt the negative impact on the quality of teaching. And then uh, Malta, Portugal, uh, Latvia, uh, with the smaller shares of those students. And again, we wanted to compare the students uh, who were enrolled already before the pandemic with the students who only started studying after the pandemic. And here too, it's the students who were enrolled already before who felt the negative impacts more. So there we can see that in most countries, more than half of the students who were enrolled before the pandemic um, feel that the pandemic is still negatively impacting the quality of teaching. And I think this raises some important questions about, um, for example, digitalization, which we will hear later about uh, when we want to look into the why, why is the teaching still negatively impacted um, by the pandemic? And why is it felt by so many students? Uh, moving on to the expected continued impact, which was then the second indicator that your student survey uh, covered. Uh, and the aspects that were studied here were whether students experience or expect the continued negative or positive impact on their further studies, on their labor market participation, and on their mental health situation. And what becomes clear here is that the first two aspects, so further studies and labor market participation after graduation, most students don't actually expect any impact of the pandemic on these aspects. It's more than 60% of students who reported that they don't expect any continued impact. But the case is a little bit different with mental health situation, where it's almost 50-50, so 44% of students uh, expect a continued negative or very negative impact on their mental health situation, and 46% of students actually expect no impact. So here also we look into different countries to see where are those students who then expect this negative impact and in which countries uh, we have the students who for some reason don't expect any impact of the pandemic on their mental health situation. So we see that if the Netherlands, Ireland and Estonia with the highest shares of students who expect a continued negative impact and the shares are a lot smaller in Norway, Azerbaijan and, and Denmark, for example, where we even have a lot more than yeah half of the students who expect no impact. And this wasn't the focus of our topical module, but we think that it would be very interesting to look into the differences maybe in, uh, in the organization of studies and in the policies regarding the pandemic uh, and compare the countries to see if, uh, if that is something that could explain these differences in how the higher education systems dealt with the pandemic. But what I would like us all to take away from here, I think the most important or interesting results here were first that we see that it's teaching quality and the contacts with fellow students that students perceive to be still negatively affected by the pandemic when the data was collected. So in summer 2022, and uh, across both of these aspects, we saw that it's the students enrolled already before the pandemic who were more likely to experience negative effects on the on teaching quality and on contacts with other students. And thirdly, we saw that whereas it's most students who don't expect any continued impact of the pandemic on their further studies and on their labor market participation, but at the same time, we saw that it's around 44% of students who do expect the continued negative impact of the pandemic on their mental health situation. That's where I have to finish today. And if I'm right, Madeleine, we will leave questions for the end, right? Yes, if there is not anything that really has to be somehow explained or specified, then, then yes, in the end, I think the wider discussion would be better. But if someone wants to ask something already now, then please let us know by raising hand or posting the question to the chat. But if not, then I think that 
it's time for Hendrik and his presentation. Yeah, thank you, um, Marlene, for your introduction earlier. Um, and also many thanks to um, you, Elizabeth, uh, for providing insight about students' perceptions of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which um, yeah, actually makes it quite easy for me to lead over to um, the topic of digitalization. And I hope you can see my slides. Yes, this does can. seem to be the case. Yeah. Okay. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic most certainly put a need for increased uh, digitalization efforts in higher education and beyond on all of our agendas. And um, the ministers responsible for higher education in Europe pointedly formulated their vision of a digitalized European higher education area in the um, Rome communique of 2020, taking both the potential as well as um, the shortcomings of remote teaching and learning into account. Namely, possibilities uh, for increased inclusion of underrepresented student groups on the one hand, and um, challenges with regards to an inflexible over-reliance on digital formats for other student groups on the other hand. Um, in my presentation, I'm going to approach the topic of digitalization first from the perspective of student satisfaction with the availability of digital services from their institutions, and secondly, illustrate um, students' preferences in learning formats in comparison to the actual requirements of studies. Following this, I'm going to um, present data indicating the extent of students' resources available to participate in digitalized edu education, closing with analyses investigating the um, relationship between digital higher education and students' um, study success prospects. And this is where my presentation actually ties in quite nicely with um, Elizabeth's. All of the information I'm going to present today, and in fact a lot more, are going to be published very soon in the Eurostudent topical module series of reports, right in time for the Tirana Ministerial Conference. So um, now, after these introductory notes, let's turn our attention to institutional services, where um, my research question is, um, to what extent students are satisfied with the digital availability of study contents and institutional support structures. Um, we see that uh, with cross-country averages ranging between 96 and 76 percent, the vast shares of students indicate a need for study aspects such as online or recorded lectures, online exams and study materials, as well as um, administration and counseling services. Students, uh, and in this case, the user's satisfaction with uh, digital availability of most of these aspects is generally high, as can be deduced from the majorities depicted here in blue bars for all but one of the examined aspects. And um, this one aspect where only a minority of users is uh, satisfied with the uh, provided services, I would like to address directly and uh, in more detail as it relates to satisfaction with digital or online counseling services. Mm. Overall, we see that on cross-country average, more than three quarters indicate a need for digital counseling services. However, uh, shares of the explicitly satisfied among those with such a need are overall considerably lower than for all of the other services we considered. We observe huge differences between countries with um, majorities of students with digital counseling service needs indicating satisfaction in uh, Azerbaijan, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia and Georgia 
but um, exceptionally large shares of students uh, who are dissatisfied in Romania, Romania, Croatia, Poland, Portugal, and Hungary. Now, why uh, am I highlighting this item in particular? We know that especially those disadvantaged uh, student groups that the ministers directly addressed in the Rome communique have increased need for counseling as um, they are facing problems other than those of more advantaged students. So um, in order to ensure inclusive participation in higher education, countries could take the findings presented here as encouragement to increase their efforts in providing digitally available counseling services. Um, moving on to the topic of actual and preferred modes of studies, um, where we screened the actual extent of online and in-person teaching and learning in comparison to students' preferences and uh, take a brief look at different student groups' demands. Mm. What I have plotted here um, compares the actual mean ratio of online and in-person study modes on the horizontal axis to the mean ratio of the preferred study modes in the country on the vertical axis. While um, low values on each axis indicate a tendency towards in-person studies, um, high values indicate tendencies towards digital studies. Now, um, taking the diagonal line, which indicates a kind of idealized balance between actual and preferred uh, ratio, as point of reference, we see that in um, many countries, the mean demand actually matches the mean um, actual format of teaching and learning. For example, Azerbaijan or Denmark, where um, a high level of actual in-person formats about matches the mean preference. Or um, Georgia, Malta and Iceland at the other end of the spectrum, where a balance between both modes is demanded and supplied. However, um, the demand for online studies outweighs the actual supply in countries considerably above the diagonal, namely Portugal, Croatia, the Czech Republic, uh, Hungary, Romania, and Austria. Uh, especially in these countries, policymakers and researchers should really take a closer look at the mismatch between the provision of digital teaching offerings and demand in the future. We also find that demands with regards to preferred study modes differ distinctly between student groups. On a broad level, younger students, students without financial difficulties, full-time students, as well as students uh, dependent on family or public support, prefer in-person teaching, while their counterparts, older students, um, students with financial difficulties, part-time students in particular, and uh, students dependent on self-earned income, uh, lean more towards online formats. And indeed, and again, here I'm only speaking about broad cross-country patterns, we observe that in many cases, the demands of these diverse student groups seem to be about reflected in their actual study modes. Or in other words, um, students are in many cases able to almost study the way they want to, uh, which roughly indicates a considerable uh, extent of flexibility with regard to study design in many countries. Certainly, um, there are cases where this is not the case, um, and this quite encouraging finding can only be a starting point, and uh, it still needs to be further investigated on national or even better institutional level, whether the provided study modes fit um, 
diverse and disadvantaged uh, student groups needs. In um, the third step, we take a look at the ability of students to participate in remote teaching and learning. And uh, here on the one hand, we need a self-assessment of students' digital skills. And on the other hand, information about the students' infrastructural equipment. Mm -hmm. As you can see, we collected quite a lot of information about um, skills here in the first column and equipment in the consecutive four columns, which actually is not too easy to grasp, I think, and quite difficult to explain or give an overview to. So this is why taking all these information into account um, and without going into too much methodological depths, I am now able to map the degree of students' digital capital in the participating countries through a method called biplot analysis, which allows us to illustrate a few points of interest on a broader level. Mm. And here, first off, we observe that the availability of a desk and a quiet place to study often go hand in hand in countries, which is why these two vectors are positioned so close to each other. Um, the availability of a computer and a sufficient internet connection, likewise, do commonly go hand in hand. And um, the degree of self-perceived digital skills of students is placed in between both of these dimensions. And this allows um, the cautious interpretation that sufficient digital skills may be the product of um, good infrastructural equipment. And uh, we can also visualize a few country patterns. While um, the student populations of most countries have a satisfactory level of digital capital. Um, these countries are placed in the center of this, um, of this graph. Students, for example, in Azerbaijan report sufficient availability of housing infrastructure for home learning, but low levels of um, digital infrastructure and uh, digital skills, which is um, the other way around in Iceland, where students have the digital devices and internet connection, as well as personal skills, but less beneficial housing infrastructure. Mm. Comparably large shares of students in Ireland and particularly in Georgia, however, report both a lack of many or most of um, these elements of digital capital. So, um, Tying all of these information together, overall, students' populations of um, most countries are quite well able to participate in uh, digital forms of teaching and learning from home. But uh, policymakers in a few countries could make efforts to improve infrastructure and skills um, in order to enable their students for digital forms of studying. And uh, finally, I address the relationship between study success and digital learning and um, ask if digital study modes affect their study success prospects. Overall, um, students across all countries express a moderate degree of um, knowing fellow students with whom to discuss subject-related um, questions with mean values ranging from 3.0 to 3.9. Notably, in all countries except Lithuania and Romania, there are significant differences among students in various teaching modes, indicating that um, Predominantly online learners tend to have considerably lower integration compared to their peers in balanced or in-person modes, as you can see in the blue dots positioned below the average in almost all countries. 
um, sorry, this finding that uh, online learning disrupts peer integration across countries should give maybe give rise to doubts about the suitability of the current use of digital media formats for learning cooperative and collaborative skills that are extremely relevant in professional life. However, there are uh, more diverse interactions between teaching modes and uh, student lecturer relationships, which can only be roughly described in the context here. Um, while online students in several countries, uh, namely Georgia, Hungary, Malta, Poland, and Romania, rate their lecturer skills superior to their peers in balanced or in-person modes. Mm -hmm. There's also a group of countries in which online students rate their lecturer skills below their peers in more traditional modes of studies. And uh, this um, mainly relates to Finland and the Netherlands, as well as um, Croatia, Denmark, and Estonia to a lesser degree. This could be an indication that there's potential for optimization in terms of online teaching quality, at least in these countries. And uh, finally, the data on students' intention to abandon higher education reveals um, varying degrees of dropout intention across countries with uh, mean values ranging here from 1.1 to 1.9. In uh, countries like Slovakia, Poland, Iceland, Lithuania, Malta, Estonia, Finland, and Azerbaijan, there are only minor or insignificant uh, differences in the dropout intention among students in different teaching modes suggesting a more consistent trend uh, throughout these respective study student populations, um, regardless of the mode of study. On the contrary, however, countries such as Georgia, the Czech Republic, Croatia, Norway, Hungary, Austria, Denmark, Portugal, the Netherlands, or Romania exhibit significant variations, indicating a more complex relationship between the dropout intention and the challenges posed by online learning. What now are the main takeaways from the information presented? Mm. Moving along my main initial questions, I can summarize that Student satisfaction with um, the digital availability of study contents and institutional support structures is good overall, with majorities in most countries. However, there is some backlog demand with regards to the counseling services. Students um, demand for either in-person or digital uh, teaching and learning goes both ways depending on diverse student groups' needs. In uh, many cases, we observe a sufficient flexibility to meet these um, different groups' preferences. Also, we have seen that um, students are commonly well-versed and equipped for studies from home, with few exceptions in uh, only a few um, specific countries. And um, finally, we have seen that there is a consistent trend of online learning disrupting peer integration, um, while there are no consistent, but nevertheless, in some countries, obvious relationships between online learning and student lecturer contacts, as well as students' dropout intention. And uh, with these closing words, I, would, I thank you for your attention. And I'm um, looking forward to your questions, suggest suggestions, and uh, comments. Thanks. Thank you very much, Hendrik. So are there any questions, comments, suggestions, either to Elizabeth or to Hendrik? Feel free to ask, raise your hand, let us know, or you can post it in the chat as well.
So I encourage you to ask and comment, but I can start maybe myself to uh, to keep it going until you think about your questions and comments. Um, uh, first of all, maybe about this digitalization topic that, um, as we know, that uh, the, the topic is widely discussed in many countries, especially after the pandemic. And, and of course, higher education institutions are looking for this ideal distribution between online learning and face-to-face -face teaching and learning. Um, Hendrik, it's a hard question, but if you have to choose one policy recommendation in this field that you would give either to policymakers or to higher education institutions, what would that be? Well, it's actually not so hard at all. I think I already mentioned it during my presentation. I um, would say that the most important thing is to screen if the, well, the demand for certain study modes, flexible study modes is really um, given not only on national level, which might be a, an even too broad uh, perspective, but better still at institutional level. Um, so um, yeah, mainly I think it's a point of constant evaluation and um, making sure that um, all of these diverse student groups um, that we have and want in higher education um, receive what they demand or need in order to participate in education. So basically, like those policymakers and higher education institutions could use Eurostudent data as the starting point that, look, these are the groups that maybe need this and those are the groups that need that. And in our country, they indicate that this ideal ratio is, is, is not ideal. So maybe we should uh, look into that in our country and in our institutions like separately. Yeah. And also, you know, I highlighted a few countries, but um, this doesn't necessarily mean that in the countries that I didn't mention, everything works well and one can be assured that um, everything is OK. Uh, it can only be a rough starting point and one should continue to dig deeper, I think. Yeah, sure. But at least we know where to look if we, we have introduced this data. Uh, any other questions or comments from, from our audience? Uh, yes, uh, Yonis is asking in the chat that, is there any hint as to the differences observed among countries in which students are experiencing high negative impact? It's probably to Elizabeth or? Right, I was, uh... I'm talking about uh, what Elizabeth uh, said at the beginning, and I was uh, um, amazed to see such uh, big differences. Do we have any idea why is that? I have to say that based on our thematic report, which was quite a, like a brief overview to see the key patterns, really, we don't know. And like I mentioned before, too, I think it would be very interesting and important to look into how the measures and policies differed between countries where we see the uh, major differences. So I have a lot of like, uh, I, I think ideas for, for further research based on this, which would be good because I think your student microdata, for example, will be available at some point to everyone. So if anybody is looking for a topic for their dissertation or a topic to commission research on so, so there is a lot of uh, material here thanks and of course the conditions in countries were different like how long was the period of lockdown and everything i think it was it was quite varied uh, but elizabeth uh, i would also like to ask you a question but it it can also easily go to a kind of <laughs> predicting or hypothetical uh, assumptions but um you showed us that um, uh, students reported and indicated that they feel that the COVID has continued negative impact uh, on their mental health, especially. Uh, do you have any idea why, why they feel it so strongly and what could be done? 
Yeah, so because we didn't go further with this analysis for this report, I was also trying to look into Hendrik's results, if there is something there that we could sort of like, yeah, grab onto. And I, I have to say that I, I don't know, but I think there might be something related to how the digitalization matches their expected and preferred uh, way of teaching and learning but it also might be in the support measures side or in how the system recovers so I th there is so many things that could mm -hmm. be behind this and there has been still a time between this current moment and the time the data was collected so probably they would answer something different now but we don't know I think it was discussed that the Euro student policy makers workshop in Hanover in, in autumn, that can it be that if there are financial difficulties, then maybe now students report it as, or indicate it as mental health issues that they feel a kind of like maybe uncertain, being in an uncertain situation or something. And I think that many financial difficulties also raised during the pandemic or after that and the inflation and everything. So there can be so many factors intertwined that that is quite a tricky question. Um, yeah, yeah. Or to how would we link this into or link this to, yeah, economies recovering and students being able to um, continue jobs to yeah, secure their financial situation, which maybe reduces overall anxiety. So, yeah. And also that again then relates to how much or how big of a role does the self-earned income pay in playing students' financing of their studies? So there's yeah. a lot of already actually the Euro student indicators that we could look into in the future to get some answers. Yeah, a lot of uh, future research to be done. But uh, Samuel raised the hand, so please, you can ask. Comment. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for your presentation. Uh, second of all, I must admit I'm from Italy, so at the moment we're not the most present in your data. <laughs> but I wanted to ask, always regarding this topic of mental health and the effect of the pandemic, um, I'm, maybe I would also like a response for both because also the distance learning has an impact. I would like to ask you your opinion on whether this, this changes also affected not, not only our relationship with peers, but also like a general sense of belonging in the university community, uh, which could mean, you know, feeling more distance between students and professors or like feeling less like the university is your community. And I say it as a student activist when I, as I see like students always and always less interested in feeling like a, a home. Yes. Thank you. Um, thanks for your question. Actually, with um, regard to the study modes, I can um, say that there are differences in sense of belonging in higher education between um, the study modes. Now, for my presentation and the report, I had to select a few as aspects, um, but this is certainly one which I would like to um, anal analyze in a more um, wholesome fashion, taking numerous um, kinds of um, determinants into account. Um, because we also, and this also applies to my presentation, have to um, keep in mind that um, the reason for increased dropout intention or um, um, decreased peer integration may not initially lie in the study mode in itself in online studies but in the student groups who are studying through online modes and um, so this is something I really would like to explore further especially with regard to a sense of belonging um, based on the micro data that we are going to publish in uh, summer. Yeah, thanks for asking, Samuel, and thanks for your reply, Hendrik. Uh, there is another question in chat. Uh, Esmeralda is uh, writing that the view of lecturers on digitalization often differs from that on stu of students. Does the data provide any indication of how these two perspectives can be brought together in teaching? Well, um, the short answer is no, um, as we didn't survey um, the lecturers. Um, 
But um, as Marlene already mentioned, we had a policymakers meeting uh, in Hanover uh, in autumn last year. And um, this brought some information about um, how lecturers are prepared um, for digital teaching and learning. Um, I'm Right now I'm aware of the case of Spain where special um, seminars uh, were held for the um, um, institutions uh, lecturers um this is these are context information which we don't really have a um yeah universal overview but um i agree that it would really be good um to hear the opinions from the other side and not only on from the user's perspective as well Indeed, and perhaps in in some countries there has been some analysis or or questionnaires uh, among uh, lecturers as well. So this could be put together if someone wants to do some further analysis. Anything else, or maybe Elizabeth, you want to comment on something that we have discussed now during the last questions? So well, Yannis has another question yeah. actually about the impact of COVID. It's a more general question, okay, just... Uh... Yeah, well, it does seem so based on the data, especially on the indicator where students were asked about the continued impact and, and especially considering that they were surveyed on the current impact on like various, all kinds of different aspects like the financing of studies or their professional skills or the grades of performance. But they were actually asked about the continued impact that they expect on only the, the three aspects. So the labor market participation, mental health, and their further studies. So there might be actually a lot of these other aspects that they felt the impact during the pandemic that they would actually expect to continue. But yeah, we don't we don't know based on your data. I see. That's pretty serious, isn't it? Uh, if I, I I initially thought that as we move away. As students end their studies and new students get into the universities, we shouldn't have been talking about uh, COVID, but still I have this feeling that we are influenced, we are still influenced, and what you just said uh, confirms that. But at the same time, maybe to keep in mind and emphasize the results that we had about the students' perceptions on the continued impact on their uh, participate labor market participation the majority of students expected no continued impact on these aspects especially after their studies whether it's their labor market uh, entry or, or their further studies after the current program so that is positive i think and actually as i mentioned earlier we don't know what would they answer now because i think it's still different it's like beginning of 2024 and the data collection was in 2022 summer so probably we also felt uh, back then that the pandemic is like closer or, or it's still like it just was but now maybe we we feel that it is we have already left that behind like it's an assumption but it can be that the situation or the answer could be a bit different now as well Any other questions or comments, or maybe you want to say some final words or or some emphasized takeaway? Maybe a comment on the last um, uh, uh, topic. Um, I think that out of the COVID, we have a lot of learnings and that was shown um, that especially, I think the expectations from students have changed about how they want their studies or the teaching to be in their universities. Um, and quite standards are shown, like a lot of old school teaching formats and methods are not really accepted anymore. And the students are more outspoken when they're not very satisfied with the quality of the teaching. And I think um, this has to be more addressed and also 
that therefore my questions for, uh, for the teachers that they have to adapt more to the whole digitalization, also the AI effects and changes what we're now experiencing more and more in higher education, that um, I think there is now like two ways apart from the teachers, they want to go to the pre COVID era, like the old methods they have used and to apply them now, but the students are not willing to just go with it. So they're more outspoken to like, to call somehow call them out on their bad teaching methods. Like when they're still just lecturers without any, uh, I don't know when they're just not, for example, recording the sessions. If they're not recording it, then there's already um, a backlash from the students. Why are you not doing it? It's not very good for them and so on. And the other part is like, okay, they want to go with the dig digitalization changes, but they're somehow overwhelmed by it. And uh, it's too fast for them because they are not digital natives, like maybe their students are. And so I think that's, that's a whole complexity with it which have been accelerated with the COVID uh, era, I would say. Indeed, v very good comments, Esmeralda. Thank you. Elizabeth or Hendrik, do you want to comment on that somehow? I just wanted to say that I, I agree and that this is also what might be behind students' uh, evaluations of the quality of teaching and especially why we see more for the students who have experience of higher education before the pandemic. Yeah, same from me. And I would like to add uh, an aspect um, relating to the more <clears throat> long-term or medium-term COVID effects, which hasn't been mentioned up till now, uh, namely relating to international student mobility. Um, which um, is such an integral and core part of the Bologna process and the European higher um, education area, um, where we already saw before the pandemic slightly decreasing shares of students participating in enrollment abroad, which might have been accelerated um, through the pandemic. And uh, we really need to evaluate in the, the upcoming years if this is the trend uh, that's going um, to hold or if there's a turning point at some time. Yeah, interesting topic to look into. Uh, I think that if there are no more questions or comments, we can start wrapping it up. Um, as Hendrik mentioned before, those topical modules uh, will be published uh, as reports. They will be available in May because the Tirana event that Hendrik also mentioned will be in the end of May. So those uh, TM reports will be available uh, by that time. And uh, you can also stay tuned uh, via your student Twitter account or your student web page. We will definitely post uh, news there as well and and let you know when the reports will be published and as i mentioned in the beginning uh, then registration to the euro student aid final conference is open and uh, you can find the link in the chat as well so if you're interested then please take your time and read what's going to happen in july in vienna and if you, if there is a chance then then please feel free to register as well uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Hendrik, for your very interesting insight to those two topics. And thanks to all our listeners for your active participation. Uh, our next webinar will be on the 13th of June, and we we'll still continue with uh, revealing Eurostudent 8 international results, and still the focus will be on topical modules at uh, this time discrimination. We will both present the international results and also as Sweden as an example. So there will be a country, country example as well. But thank you everyone and uh, have a nice day. Thanks Marlene, bye. Thank, thank you, bye. bye.